Hello everyone, I'm Everton de Oliveira from the Groundwater Project and we're here today to release a very nice new book for you. Very interesting, I like the reading and I'm pretty sure you would like to. The book is Geophysical Logging for Hydrogeology and I'm here with the authors uh, who kindly offered to, to show up today and talk a little bit about the, the book. Uh, the, the first author is John Williams. Is a groundwater and borehole geophysical specialist with the United States Geological Survey. He has a Bachelor in uh, of Arts in Geology from Colgate University and a Master's of Science in Geoscience from Pennsylvania State University. He has taught regional and national courses on borehole geophysics in the United States, United Arab, Arab Emirates, Iraq, Kurdistan, and India. Wow. Uh, the other author is Frederic Payet, or Payet, it's a French name, I believe, right? He's an adjunct professor of geoscience at the University of Arkansas, an emeritus research scientist with the United States Geological Survey's National Research Program. He received a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical and Aerospace Science from the University of Rochester in 1968, and then completed his Doctor of Philosophy in the same department specializing in geophysical fluid dynamics in 1974. Welcome, congratulations for your nice book. First of all, tell us a little bit of, about your career. What is the drive to write this book, please? Welcome. John, do you wanna start first? Or? Sure. Um, so uh, after I got my master's at, at Penn State, I started working with the US Geological Survey in, in Pennsylvania. And that office had a long history of using borehole geophysics and groundwater investigations. So I got right into logging wells. Uh, this was an old analog system, uh, just very simple logs, caliper, single point resistance, gamma. But um, I had a number of projects, fractured rock, aquifer projects, that we learned, learned a lot. So I got very interested um, in, in applying borehole geophysics and um, uh, it, just grew, it just grew from there. Very nice. Okay. Okay. In, in my case, I started out as a uh, assistant professor at a university in Ohio and uh, was primarily interested in groundwater modeling in buried sand and gravel uh, deposits. And the, the key factor there was find out exactly where the gravel was and how thick it was. And uh, moral geophysics was the way to go to, uh, uh, to actually delineate the aquifers we were going to model. And I sort of fell under the, uh, the auspices of the local US Geological Survey office. And uh, when an opening came in the national research program, they said, well, why don't you apply for that? And I did. And, I ended up spending most of my career running the borehole geophysics project for the uh, USGS NRP. That's, that's quite nice, <clears throat> quite nice. So what is for, for, for our potential reader, what is geophysical logging and to whom is this book designed? What is the initial background necessary to better learn from your book? Who wants to go? Go ahead, Fred. All right, well, let me, I'm, I, I guess I'm the Boral Geophysics Zealot. Uh, my, I, my basic uh, mantra is that, that uh, if you drill a hole in the subsurface to find out what's there, you end up looking at a piece of pipe sticking out of the ground. Uh, it's only when you actually make measurements in the, the uh, borehole that you've drilled that you get some idea of what you've penetrated and what's distributed along the, uh, uh, the well bore. And, the way I often present this is that the, the well logs give you three specific things that you can't get almost any other way. Uh, first of all, you get a continuous profile of what the borehole has encountered from bottom to top. Uh, if you try to sample with cores or, or uh, drill cuttings, you always end up missing pieces and not knowing exactly where they came from. Uh, secondly, you're measuring the properties of the formation where it is not after it's been disturbed and removed from the hole. And then thirdly, and probably most importantly, uh, the subsurface is a multivariate environment. Uh, for example, if you measure electroconductivity from the surface with geophysics, 
you don't know whether that conductivity is caused by the minerals, by the water, or what's in the water. And the nice thing about well logs is you have probes with more than one measurement. And so you can measure four or five different physical properties that depend in different ways. And you, you sort of have a, 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 a multivariate system of equations that you can then uh, systematically solve for how much of that conductivity is from solutes and how much of it is from clay minerals uh, and how much is from uh, potentially other sources such as the the uh, geometry of the uh, flow system. So you, you get an awful lot of information out of well logs that you can't get uh, any other way or uh, that's really critical for putting a depth scale on surface geophysical measurements that you make. So it's it's really an important part of the uh, uh, hydrogeological exploration process. Admittedly, I'm a zealot, but uh, that's my <laughs> take on the, the need for well logging. I agree with you. Go, go John. Uh, yeah, so it's, uh, it's, it's a method for to collect unbiased uh, in, information. You could have a three different geologists look at well cuttings and they would come up with maybe three different interpretations. So but if you run a gamma log in a well, it's gonna, it, right, it's exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, and I, th this chapter that, that, that we've uh, prepared is for uh, largely for hydrogeologists that have some experience or no experience with, with borehole geophysics. And just to open their eyes to the possibility of just let's not just drill a well, let's also get all the information that we can out of it through borehole geophysics. Very good. Very good. What, what is the, the, the yeah. main background that you, you think it's, it's necessary for that? I mean, high calculus or something like that, because geophys uh, you know, uh, geologists are always scared about geophysics, and it's not that <laughs> bad when you, when you do learn it, right? Right, so, so a lot, lot of this is um, just looking at several different logs, and from that, trying to come up with, as Fred said, is it the mineralogy that's affecting? Is it the clay? Is it, is it the water formation? So there are a lot of tried and true, true methods that don't involve advanced math mathematics, but you know, simple, simple, uh, simple mathematics is in a large part can get you a, a long way. Obviously, uh, the more complex ones, you, you may need to go into more uh, higher mathematics. Good. Well, I think one unique aspect of well logging is that uh, when old timers like me started out in the business, we were primarily just looking for water. And then the environmental movement came along and that has really blossomed into uh, a whole wealth of, of new applications. And the, the issue is often one of you have a test well and you sample it and something bad comes out in the water. Uh, you really don't know exactly where that came from. Is it the entire aquifer or is it one particular zone? And uh, uh, the well locking allows you to put the, uh, the water sample in the context of the formation uh, it came from. And with the advent of high resolution flow meter locking, you're able to actually identify specifically where the water's coming in and uh, by mass balance uh, equations, figure out how much of the contaminant is coming in from each specific zone. And that's a, a real step forward for uh, hydrogeology and modeling what's going on on the subsurface. Where is the plume and, and what's driving it? Yeah, it's a money saver actually, right? Because you, you, you know where, where to put your, your remedial products if you have to and things like that. Because it's, well, it's, it's what we call a, a, a chicken and egg problem. Uh, you, you, if you complete the well for a very long interval you don't know where the water came in but if you want to get precise information you have to put your screen at a five foot interval and if it's not the right one uh you've wasted all your effort exactly. so what you, you've got to know where the contaminant is coming in uh, but you have to find out where it's coming in first before you can really monitor it that's true well in, in your book you you have a, a summary table of the geophysical loggings 
used for groundwater investigations that is likely the most complete uh, to date, for at least the most complete I've ever seen, right? Uh, please tell us about, about it a little bit, about the methods and how the book content re uh, contents relate to the stable, because you have, you know, it's so nice, so complete. Congrats for that uh, organization, guys. Yeah, thank, thank, thank you very much. I mean, there's, there's obviously a lot of information out there, um, and we just tried to compile it uh, in a concise in a concise manner and um, give give the application give a give a little bit of theory um, to, to just make a very useful uh, a useful uh, uh, chapter. Fred, well, I think what, one aspect that has to be added to that is that if you were to ask me what is the the single biggest cause of mistakes made in well log interpretation, uh, I would say the answer is depth correlation. You know, you, you have these logs that are hundreds of feet or hundreds of meters in length, and you make different measurement runs. And if you, you try to correlate something that was measured at nominally 100 meters, and one section set of data actually comes from 101 meters and the other comes from 99 meters, uh, you can make some really big mistakes. So, so the first thing you do with a set of well log data is you you correlate it and depth adjust it so that the character is consistent across the line. And in my experience, a relatively novice uh, level uh, hydrologist using the, the, the well logs will take depths at their nominal phase value and make some, some pretty serious mistakes based on that. Yeah, definitely. That's, I've, I've seen that. The, the, cl the, the classic one that you see over and over again is where is the log referenced to? And is it land surface? Is it a Kelly bushing? Is it top of casing? So very often you see this three foot off, 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 offset between, between log, logs, because one person's measuring from land surface, the other one's doing the top of, top of casing. Yes. That's, that's a classic one that we run into all the time. Definitely, Def yes, yes, that's very true. Well, and the other thing that happens is that that the uh, the depth control on the log is based on on uh, friction against the measuring wheel and if your probe gets as it's going down the well if it gets hung up on something you're still feeding out cable but the probe is not going down and uh, that that can be a serious uh, issue so uh, one of the things you're going to want to do is to, is to look at each log as it comes out and and see if the same uh, you know, uh, shifts in value occur at the same depth, uh, just to make sure you don't have any any uh, uh, serious errors. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Especially if the if the the well is uh, already equipped and you have and you have the cables there uh, and you want to do it, that that's quite common to happen. Yeah, that's yeah. true. That's true. Okay, so you, you, you mentioned you, you have different uh, situations here, like direct push construction, like down the hole and petrophysical locks. What are the difference and when do we have to use them? Right, so, so the direct, so the direct uh, push is the newer technology. The wire line is a tried and true that is still has a, a, you know, a very good, very good place. But for a lot of the shallow environment, Metal work, uh, the direct push logging, has really uh, is the state of state of the art, and allows has a number of advantages. Uh, one, you're not generating a lot of lot of cuttings or, or fluids. Um, the direct push has the advantage that you're right in contact with the with the formation. So, um, so definitely the. Uh, uh, the direct push method um, is is really uh, state of the art for the shallower. Uh, the disadvantage is you hit a boulder with a direct pu push system, you're not going to you're not going to get very far. So yeah. it definitely has its limitations, and you're only talking you know the top thirty meters or so that direct push is applicable uh, for, or possibly a little deeper. What about the petrophysical longings and, and 
and the other, the, the logs and the, down the whole business? What's the difference of them? Right, so I, you know, you can broadly um, look at, is it a bedrock fractured problem or is a, a primary porosity and permeability problem? And then also, are you interested in, in water quality? So looking at the type of environment you're lacking in, the type of hole, what the objectives are, you would come up with the with a suite of logs that you would you would want to want to run, run in any particular particular well. Uh, so there's a, a fractured rock. Well, we would consider a fractured rock a toolbox in which you're in a bedrock situation. You essentially are logging in open holes. Mm -hmm. So you want to go with the Im imaging a lot a lot of the imaging acoustic optical televiewers and 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 flow meters. If you're in an unconsolidated situation. Um, in mud, you know, there are certain logs that can run in, in mud or PVC case, steel case. So it's, it's um, you know, you've got to match your objectives with the whole conditions and uh, with the different tools. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, that's true. Uh, what about, uh, Fred was mentioning, what about fluid and flow logs? Uh, when to use them? And how to? Yeah, Fred. Fred's really the pioneer of, of, of flow meter work. So I'll. Uh... Okay. Well, it, the the idea was that that uh, in complicated aquifers where you have multiple flow zones, you want to know where the water is coming from, and how the uh, the solute content of those individual flow zones are are mixing to give you the composite flow you're measuring, and uh, my research project went to great lengths to design high resolution flow meters that allow you to, to pump a borehole at less than a gallon per minute and identify all the inflow zones and uh, in the process not generate much contaminated water to have to dispose of at contamination sites uh, and also not ach achieve so much drawdown that you don't have any, any fluid filled hole to work with. So it was a, a a really important uh, breakthrough to be able to generate those methods and then come up with the software routines that allow you to analyze that data. Uh, so for example, we uh, identified the inverse problem that if you pump, if you measure flow in a well, uh, the distribution of flow under two different conditions, one of, it could, of which could be the ambient state, uh, you can then solve that set of equations simultaneously to get both the transmissivity, that is the integrated permeability of each zone, but also the, the hydraulic head of those zones. Uh, and it turns out that in things like karst applications, uh, measuring permeability doesn't tell you much because it's determined by the immediate vicinity of the borehole. But measuring the hydraulic head tells you where the water is coming from uh, on a larger scale fashion. So the ability to actually measure permeability for a zone and its hydraulic head uh, allows you to say something really important about the flow system. And it also gets you away from having to use straddle packers, which are really cumbersome and expensive to use. And uh, whereas you can do all of this at, at, as part of the logging operation. And a byproduct is that if you've ever initially working in fractured rock sites, I try to come up with other ways of measuring permeability. And then they would uh, schedule a packer rig, but it couldn't come in for the next six months. Uh, they're measuring the, the flow under completely different flow conditions. So it's nice to be able to you know, measure the well and actually get the flow response all in one operation. Yeah, that's true. Uh, when you, when you were talking, I was thinking of my experience that we had problems with packers. That's always difficult <laughs> to use, right? Uh, and you, you and you have to to find the, the right packer that fits your well in the right position, right? Because depending on the formation, it doesn't work properly. It is so hard. It is well, the, the, the we had a classic example in a fractured rock study where where we uh, had a core hole drilled, very small diameter, to hold down the expenses. 
but then the Packers were designed to fit in a six inch hole. So we reamed out the hole and the Packers wouldn't work. And well logging showed that the problem was that the, the reamed hole did not follow the, you know, they were side by side. And so you had a secondary side on the borehole that would uh, conduct the flow. So, uh, you know, even when you have good, uh, nominally good Packer data, uh, you really need the borehole data to put it all into to, uh, context. I know it's, it can be very frustrating. That's true. But the, the, then you, you, your method, we, we can use the, the, the single hole to, 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 to get all the data from a single hole, right? Yes, that's right. Very good. Yeah, I've seen it in the book. That's very good. So that's good for people that are looking for this information because it's quite important if you can get this information. It's, it's you know, it's a big advance. It's a big advance, really. Well, I, I think one, one important aspect of our book was that the, the best training device is actually uh, specific field examples to show you where the, the, the hydraulic information comes out of the well logs. Yep, I agree. I agree, and you and you and you, you did a good job. You you uh, you have many examples in the book. It's very good. It's very good. So uh, how how to to interpret the data? How to couple them with other groundwater information? Like what are the examples you have in the book? Since you're talking about it. Yeah, a, a, a big thing is to to have a, a software package that you can composite everything together and look at everything together, make those de depth adjustments because you have depth adjustments in your, in, your, in your logs themselves, but then also the other pieces of information that you're trying to compile together. And, and I, I think that is a, a big step forward is have digital data that you can integrate uh, all, all together together and look at it in, in, in one package. And one of the things that we've come across is you, you many times you have a, a borehole geophysicist come in, then you've got a hydrologist just person, a geologist, then you have somebody sampling water quality and nobody's putting it all together. So putting it all together is really the powerful, uh, the, uh, the, the power of this, of this information, the synergistic so uh, yeah, now now having digital type data and, and software to do that is is a great step forward. You're not cutting and pasting logs, paper logs, and things like that. You know, that's true. True, Brad. Well, and and uh, don't forget the surface geophysics. Uh, you know, they you you get some pretty fuzzy pictures from the surface, but when you tie them to boreholes, you know that. You have an anomaly, and now you see exactly what that anomaly is, and you have an idea of uh, you, know, you see there's an anomaly down there, uh, and now you have a couple of specific examples of exactly what that anomaly is, and uh, uh, together you get a better picture for for what you're dealing with. Definitely, you can match them, yes, because it's from one from surface is very hard. Yeah, it's just you know you're always guessing something. You know, but I I agree with you. That's that is a big step. That's a big step. Oh, guys, finally, uh, one thing for that, that people always ask, uh, when should we use geophysical logging? When is it cost effective? Where is the gray area there? Because people, you know, when people go there, they always say, well, that's, geophysics is expensive. That's the first thing we, we, we hear when we're trying to, to log wells, right? That's the, the, the first thing. Well, my answer to that is, um, what is the cost of drilling? I mean, you you drill you drill a borehole, and you have what you have is a pipe sticking out of the ground. <laughs> and what what is the fraction of of that cost that amounts to the well log? And the other real issue is they they uh, like this uh, Liberty Mutual uh, insurance commercial. You don't want to get what you don't need, and so they try to limit the number of logs they're running. Uh, even though much of the cost of the logging is just showing up at the site. Uh, yes, yes. So uh, I, I think just step back and ask how much did I pay to drill this, this uh, borehole and how important is the information I'm going to get out of it? It's, it's pretty hard to conceive of drilling any kind of hole without logging it. Uh, just because it, you get so much more information. Yes, that's, that's what it is, yes. 
John, you want to add something? Uh, no, I think Fred summed sub that up. Yeah, I mean, uh, when, when you compare it to the cost of drilling, uh, it's, it's for, a, it, it, you know, the time it takes and the yep. money involved, uh, the benefit is, is, is uh, you know, tenfold. Yep, it's huge. Yep. The benefit is huge, I agree. I totally agree. Yep. Okay, uh, okay, guys. So uh, our time is up here. We, we have to, to finish up. Would you would you make your final remarks? I'd like to thank you very much and congratulate you for, for this nice book. I really enjoy reading it. I, I believe it is uh, well target for the, 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 the public you aim at. Congratulations for a job well done. And congratulations. Think thank you for participating in the project. One point that, that we didn't emphasize is that, that uh, there are many different versions of, of logging you can use. So uh, there are what we call suitcase loggers that you can literally carry like a suitcase for a, a small homeowner as well. And then there are giant rigs that can go to 20,000 feet in depth in, a, in the oil field and lots of things in between. And so there's a, a lot of flexibility in exactly how you get those logs, uh, depending upon the scope of the project you're involved with. Okay. Any any final remarks, John? Uh, no, I I, I just um, uh, it, for me it was very enjoyable to to put this together. Uh, you know, I I learned a lot doing it, um, and uh, I hope it I hope it's uh, useful to 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 people, and uh, I just encourage everybody to get out there and log. Very good. Very good. Yep. Right. Yeah. So I you know I. I, you know, I've been at this business for so long that, you know, I remember that I, my office had a staff of a dozen people who spent most of their time just organizing and copying and cataloging and, and uh, taking care of these cabinet after cabinet of, of, of uh, analog data. And I, I sort of progress just kept pace with retirement because as these people would retire, I wouldn't have to replace them because we were going more and more digital. So it, uh, I was just amazed at how well that worked out. <laughs> just like it, right? <laughs> yeah. That's very good. All right, congratulations, guys. I'll, I'll, make, I'll, I'll put a, a great effort. I like, I like the topic, really, and I think it's really important. Uh, I'll put a, a good effort to see if we can get uh, translators to, to bring your book into different languages, right? Uh, for sure in Portuguese and here but uh, in many other languages, it's going to be a, a huge contribution. Okay. Thank you very much for showing up and congratulations. Yep. Thank you for giving us a chance to say our, our piece. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're very welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Yep. Bye. Yep. Bye-bye.